are here to praise God, to worship God at this time, before we bring on the praise team, I want you to do something. I want you to think of one friend. Everybody got that one friend? Now pick up your phone and dial that friend. Invite them to LLBN worship at this time. Be sure to do that. And now let's bring on the praise, bring on the worship. Praise team. with music. Join us in singing, I'll fly away. Let's all 
all sing together.
will you pray with me? Our loving, wonderful, gracious Heavenly Father, you are worthy of our praise, and we invite your presence here at LLBN Worship and all over that this worship is touching all over the world. We thank you that through your life, your death, your resurrection, that we can see your mercy, your justice, your goodness, your provision, and your victory. We thank you, Lord, that you lift us up when we are weighted down. We thank you that you provide for all your children. And we especially desire to praise your holy name as long as we live. And we pray that through LLBN, that you are the true light that lights lives and blesses nations. We thank you, Jesus. Amen. Welcome again here to Loma Linda Live, the worship, LLBN. Here we are again in praise and songs and prayer. And let's remember, Christ alone can save the world. But Christ will not do it alone. He has called you. He has called me. And we here at LLBN, we are grateful for your sacrificial giving. You have given until it really helps. I've driven by the site. I see the still has come in. I see progress being made. So continue to give, not until it hurts, but until it helps. And we thank God for you, what you have done and what you will continue to do. The ministries worldwide for the global family will be blessed. This ministry, it's a calling, a career we're paid for, a calling we're made for. And you've been made for just such a time as this in the LLBN program of ministry to the world. Thank you. Little Will was this tall. And when he looked outside, the snow was this high. It was cold that morning, and he didn't want to stay inside. He was so frustrated. Mommy knew it, too. Well, she said, maybe this is the day to go to kindergarten. You've been wanting to do that for a long time. Why don't we bundle you up and get you in the car? Oh, he was so excited. Wow. He really got to get, go to school and to see other kids and to play all day instead of staying indoors all alone with that snow outside. So bundle up, they did. Mama put on all of these layers of clothing and finally she brought out a woolen cap. And she said, now put this on. And he said, oh, do I have to? It's so itchy. And she said, no, everybody wears a cap in this weather. It's zero degrees. You will not see another person out there without a hat on. All right. So they got in the car. It was very cold, and he was so happy to snuggle up in the warmth. And as they pulled out, Mommy noticed that it was really, really slippery on the road, so she knew that she had to go very slowly. As she backed out, it slipped a little bit, and she thought, oh, I'm going to have to really watch it. So she crept along, and it seemed to take forever until they passed all the houses, and there was this very long, long road with the schoolhouse down at the end. But as she rounded the corner, the car started sliding, and it was uneasy. And then it started sliding closer to the side of the road, and that would have been all right. But there was a steep bank going down at the edge. And all of a sudden, there was nothing they could do but sink right over. Oh, my word. They went down. Nobody saw them. And they went down, down, down the bank and landed into this great big field of snowy white with nothing else there. 
as white as you could see, as far as you could see, there was nothing and no one, not even a bird. What do we do now, thought Mommy. We're all alone. There's the steep bank, and then there's the road up there, and nobody saw us fall over. And she looked at little Will, and he said, What are we going to do, Mommy? And he, she said, I don't know. And he said, Well, we'll just tell Jesus. Oh, she thought, Well, oh, yes, yes, that's what we need to do. And so she said, Will, why don't you pray? And little Will said, Dear Jesus, we're stuck in the snow and there's nobody around. Could you please come help? Amen. It was a short little prayer, for Will was only three and a half. But when they opened their eyes, the strangest thing, there was a man at the window knocking on it with his sleeves rolled up and a shovel. What was that? Are you stuck? He motioned. Yes, but where did you come from? Because as far as they could see, there had been nothing but white and no one around. So he ran around the back. He was shoveling for about 10 seconds, that's all, and came back and said, try it now. There's a little road right ahead of you that she hadn't seen where she could creep up and up and up very slowly The car started up the hill, and they kept getting closer to the top, and she said, Oh, please, dear Jesus, let us not slip back. And they got up and safely onto the big road. She turned to wave at him, but there was no man there, nothing, no footprints. And she said to Will, Did you see that? And he said, Yes, he wasn't wearing a hat, Mommy. There was nobody there. Sometimes, boys and girls, Jesus sends angels in all kinds of ways, disguised as men with shovels and other things we just never know. But here's what we do know. He comes, he answers when you call. And little Will never forgot that. And there are many more stories, and I'll look forward to tell you, telling you more next time. He has showed you, O man, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you, to act justly, and to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God.
children leave their Sabbath schools with smiles. Remember me when they're old enough to teach, old enough to reach, old enough to lead. Wasn't that great? We love you guys. Thank you, Sergio and Silvino, and Melissa, and everybody. Thank you for the children's story. Just to tell you a little tidbit that you wouldn't know otherwise, but uh, Silvino, who just finished singing the song, graduated from a nursing program this summer. And they had the pinning program this last Sunday. We couldn't all go. I watched it on the phone. Graduated number one from the number one nursing program in all of Orange County. And we're proud of these people. Been our friends for a long time, 20 years we've known these people. I'm pastoring a church, again, halftime. We had a big funeral this week that was uh, difficult Man got smashed between two semi-trucks just a few miles away from here. Five adult children, just difficult. His wife couldn't come over. She lives in Tijuana. And there's been politics somewhere in the past among some of the group there, the Hispanic group. And I watched as the crowd gradually came around, and by the end of the funeral... There must have been 250 people standing all around, everyone with a mask. And I met one after the other who would, someone would say, yeah, I used, to, I used to go here. I got baptized here. I used to be a head deacon here, Pastor Dan. But gradually, different ones have gone here, gone there. Some have stayed. Something happened. <laughs> I don't know what happened. Maybe they moved. It's usually something a little bit sad. Some act that wasn't really loving. We're talking today about love and mercy. Have you heard the story about a couple that uh, church every week? And one day the wife wasn't there. Pastor said, where's your wife? Well, we had a fight. You guys fight? <laughs> every day for 25 years, Pastor. Oh, that's not right. What did she say to you today? She said, she said, come out from under the bed and fight like a man. <laughs> These are church people. I had a couple come to see me one time at La Sierra many, many years ago. And somehow he said, Pastor Dan, we got in this terrible fight. She chased me all over the house, Pastor Dan, with a broom trying to kill me. So finally, I don't know what else to do. I climbed up in the basketball hoop. And she was there whacking at him up there in the basketball hoop. These are my church people in church every week. A friend of mine was pastor of a Filipino church. Not that long ago, they tried to get two churches to merge. I think it was a Filipino and a, maybe a Tongan church, Islander church of some kind. Beautiful people on both sides. But somehow as they tried to mix 
There was tension over who got which positions and who got more, I don't know what all. And after one potluck, there was a fight between two ladies, and they were rolling on the ground, and all the church members standing around. And the merger didn't work. They had to all go back to the church they come from. It wasn't going to work. <laughs> then the Philippines last year, and the uh, president said to me, Pastor Dan, we have, uh, we have an Ellen White church. I said, what do you mean, Ellen White church? Well, what they meant was a lady who dressed in long, old-fashioned clothes, but stood at the door and judged everybody who came in. I don't like that picture of Ellen White, because she's not that. She talked against that. But that's somehow their picture. This lady would judge them on their clothes, their jewelry, their practices, or whatever else. And they said, Pastor Dan, that was a full church. And she destroyed that church from 120 down to 20 people. Fighting. And the verse we have today, boils it all down. We're doing a series we call the Simple Series. You can put it on a t-shirt. And here in the book of Micah says, what does the Lord require of you? It's going to boil it all down to one little verse. Do justly, love mercy, walk humbly before your God. If you don't have time to read a lot of the Bible, <laughs> you read that verse, you'll, you'll probably do okay. Do justly, love mercy, walk humbly. We're talking about love mercy, but what if you're not all totally loving all the time. <laughs> what, if, what if you're only loving maybe 80% of the time? You love most people, and you love most people most of the time, but there are just some people that are really hard. We all know them. Your family, your church, work. You have to love everybody. You got to love the Democrats, too. Or if you're done, you got to love the Republicans. I grew up as a Dodger fan. We hated the San Francisco Giants. Jack Clark came up and hit a home run to knock us out of the playoffs. Oh, we hated him. We've got to love him, the dem. Do you have any exceptions? My brother got in trouble when we were in college years ago. We didn't think it was that big a deal, but the president overruled everybody and sent my brother out of the school. We had a hard time with that brother for 25 years. <laughs> finally, finally got over it. What do you do? The Bible says, be ye therefore perfect. Perfect in love. All the time. Love, mercy, it says. What do you think? So I made a list. No exceptions for people who don't do what you want. No exception for people who don't look like you. No exceptions for when you're tired or under stress, for when your kids are being terrible, when the cop is writing you a ticket, no exceptions when the airline loses your suitcase or somebody is late or somebody cuts you off on the freeway or if they're Democrats or if they just fouled you in a basketball game. Do we really have to be 100% loving to 100% of the people all the time? Not easy. I preached on grace and forgiveness one time in a big La Sierra church. <laughs> Standing at the door, a guy came out the door. I knew him. We were friends together. But he hurt me. Hurt me a lot. And he said, Pastor Dan, I just want to say I'm sorry. Would you forgive me for what I did? <laughs> I just preached on forgiveness. What am I supposed to do? Not easy. I had a girl broke up with me, cheated on me when we were dating years ago. Somehow bothered her, and she wrote me a note recently. Please forgive me. How do you let it go? Do we have to forgive all? I had a guy named Julio in my church. He had uh, showed me his back. He took his shirt off. He said, I got stabbed. Nineteen wounds in his back. The guy knifed him. How do you forgive that? I've passed out a lot of women who were abused when they were young. Somebody touched them. Someone did something they should not have done. Now we're supposed to forgive, love them, love mercy. 
When 9-11 happened, someone called me. I was pastor of last year. And they said, Pastor Dan, we should have some kind of a worship service for people to come if they want to go somewhere. So we opened up the church, sent out an email. If anyone wants to come, maybe 100 people came. I had to say something. <laughs> I didn't have one minute to prepare that day for anything. It just showed up. And just coming up with something, I said, you know, we're going to forgive these terrorists who have done this terrible thing. What would Jesus do? Boy, he should have gotten to see the message I got afterward. Pastor Dan, <laughs> tonight was not the night. Maybe next year, maybe some other time you can talk about forgiving. We lost 30, we lost 3,000 Americans today. And tonight was not the night to talk about forgiveness. Oh, okay. It's not easy to be loving all the time. There someone said, forgive everybody, everything, every day. Really? Can you really live up to that? And here Jesus says, I require this of you, love, mercy. I decided I was going to send money to a little boy in Africa. I call it Compassion International. You write a little letter, and they give the letter to the little boy, and he writes a letter back to you, and he gets food and school and clothes. You're 20 some dollars back then. But after a while, I was single. I couldn't keep up with that and pay my church offerings and everything. And I found, I, I can't do this. So I stopped. My brothers and I were talking about it. My brother said, you can't do that. Stop. This kid's going to get a letter in Africa. We're sorry. You have no more money for food, no more money for clothes. Because some rich man in America can't send you $20. I thought, well, sound too good. <laughs> Here. Our family, my mother, my brothers and I, were all at General Conference, I think in Atlanta or somewhere. We got out of the hotel, and I just checked in on my mom. I said, Mom, did you leave a tip? You're supposed to leave a tip? My mother's 81 years old, pastor's wife. I said, Mother, you've been in hotels all over the world. You've never given a tip a single time. I didn't, I didn't know I was supposed to. All these poor ladies cleaning that room for nothing. My mother's a saint. I doubt if she's committed five sins in her whole life. But she's not tipping in her rooms. Can she be saved? <laughs> Does that count? Love mercy, but you don't tip anybody? Are there no exceptions? Do we have to love all the time? Does God love all the time? Let's start with that. God really loving all the time. What about all these Old Testament stories? The Bible says God is chesed. Hebrew Old Testament word. And in that word it means love, it means joy, it means forgiveness, it means mercy. All of that package of words. But one of the words it means is faithfulness. Chesed is faithfulness. He is always chesed. He is always loving. He is always merciful. There's no exception. There's no fine print. There's no nights off. This is who God is. At the rock solid of his character, Jesus said New Testament, God is love. He is chesed. He loves mercy all the time. He loves everybody all the time, no matter what, who they are. Malachi 3, 6, I change not. Sorry, I never change who I am. I'm always loving. Hebrews 13, 8, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. Well, you're going to ask me, what about those Old Testament stories, Pastor Dan? There's some stories. As a touch in the ark, that doesn't sound very loving. Korah, Dathan, and Abiram, the ground opened up. 200 people died. But every single story has to fit. God is love. God is chesed. Faithful. All the time. Loves mercy. So sometimes God in a broken world doesn't know what to do when he's tried everything already. Doesn't know what else to do to wake these people up and keep them alive. With tears streaming down his face, he does some hard things. This is first death, not second death, when he touched Uzzah, Lot's wife. They still have a chance to live forever. 
But everything God does ultimately is chesed, love. It's faithful. I don't know where I got this illustration, but years ago, <laughs> I tried this out, and it seems to make sense to people, so let me try it on you. We were in Malaysia one time with my brothers and my mother and had a night free, and my brother had You've Got Mail movie on a computer, so we watched it. <laughs> and if you know the movie, Meg Ryan hates Tom Hanks because he got a huge bookstore, and he's driving her little bookstore out of business. She hates him. But at the same time, on the email, the email was newly out, she's falling in love with a guy, and we're watching the movie, we know it's the same guy. She doesn't know. She hates one, loves the other. And the movie works around, finally, you know, they're going to try to get together, doesn't work out, doesn't work out. But finally, at the end of the movie, they meet in the park, and <laughs> she finds out that it's the same guy. And that's what we have to find out in the Bible. The Old Testament God and the New Testament God are the same God. You cannot separate God the Father and the Son, Jesus Christ. They are the same God. They are both chesed. Their God is chesed. He is faithful. He is loving all the time. We cannot distinguish between these two sides of God. Well, let's go to some implications now. What does it mean, love, mercy? I mean, you've got to love grace. Grace and mercy are the same. God is a God of grace and mercy. God forgives all the time. He is always merciful. That's who he is. You've got to love that about God. David commits murder and adultery. Prophet comes in, thou art the man. God forgives him. Read some of the stories of these kings. Some of those kings were terrible. And they got punished, and they took some consequences. And God would forgive them and put them back as the king. God is merciful. That's what he is. Peter said, I'll never deny you, G. I'll never, I'll never do that. Denies them that night three times. God forgives them. He says, go tell the disciples and tell Peter. He's okay with me. He's forgiven. That's who God is. God is chesed. And can we be crystal clear about this? God is love all the time. And you have to love that. You have to love mercy. This is what the Lord requires of you. You have to love mercy. You have to love his mercy. If you don't want to just love mercy, he said, no, I'm going to get a little credit for what I do. I keep the Sabbath. I give money to LLBN. I, I, uh, I set up the chairs for the funeral this week. I've been helping with the food ministry. I've been, I've been. And you want a little credit, then you don't love mercy. God says, this is what I require of you, that you love mercy. So it starts with loving God's mercy. Maybe if you don't love mercy, you're not really saved. Because that's how we're saved, is by Mercy. And we believe that moment sins are gone, that God will cast all of our sins to the depths of the sea. Sins are gone. This guy, Reggie Bush, great football player at USC. Anybody else who follows sports knows his name, Reggie Bush. So fast. Heisman Trophy winner, the best football player in the country. But somebody got some money they shouldn't have gotten. And uh, they came after him. It was maybe not his fault, somebody's fault, parents' fault, somebody. And he had to give back his Heisman Trophy and all the trophies that took his name like he never existed. All the things he had done never happened until just a few months ago. He had 10 years and they put it all back. But that's what God does. He wipes out the record. It doesn't matter anymore. <laughs> LeBron James. One of the best ever. But someone got a video of a 20-year-old kid dunking over LeBron James. Boy, they didn't want that out there. <laughs> All his shoe people and everybody else, they didn't want this video to be out there. Some kid could kind of dunk on LeBron James. So they got out there and made sure they got rid of every single video except one. There was no record except one guy kept it. But that's what we believe about God. He takes the record of our sins, and they're gone. They're gone. I was in a barbershop. 
Adventist barber over here in Riverside. Been going there for 20 years, and in a barber shop, you hear stories. And he said, let me tell you a story, Pastor Dan. The guy came to the barber shop who told him the story. Went to Las Vegas, and there's one stretch there that's a long way. They're just straight. Not many cars sometimes late at night. This guy had a hot car, and he got a ticket for going 140 miles an hour on that freeway. <laughs> car couldn't keep up with him, but the police, the airplane kept caught up with him, sent the message down to the police car, and they finally got a hold of him. $4,000 ticket. You're not $4,000. So he went back up to Las Vegas to try to somehow pray, get out of this ticket. Prayed all the way there. Walked in the door, was waiting, finally came, calls his name, goes up there. You hear, yes. The police who did the, the ticket here, the airplane ticket was there. But not the guy who drove the police car who actually gave him the ticket. Didn't make it. The judge grinned. He said, this is your lucky day. This is Christmas and New Year's and your birthday all into one. Uh, your charges are dismissed. You're free to go. <laughs> As he walked out that door, the airplane police said, you dirty dog, you know, you deserve that ticket. And the guy says, I know, I know. I've been praying all the way here, and I've been pr I'll pray all the way back. But he was guilty as a snake, and it was gone. Wiped away. That's what God does. He is the God of mercy. The Bible says in Revelation 12, 11, the accuser of the brethren has been cast down. And here in Micah 6, 8, he says, you have got to love mercy. You have to love God's grace. God requires that. But number two, you have to treat other people as perfect. You do the, do the little relationship here. How does God you, treat you and me? As if we've never sinned, as if we're perfect. How does God treat everybody else? All these people in here, all perfect. Now, I know they're probably not perfect. Dr. Taylor, probably perfect by now. But maybe not some of these other people in here. But God treats them as if they're perfect. He doesn't treat them by what he sees. He treats them by Jesus. And then he says, love one another as I have loved you. And God wants us to love mercy with each other in the same way that he loves us us. God doesn't see. He doesn't treat us by what he can clearly see. He treats us as perfect. Sins are gone. And he wants you and I to look around at each other and treat each other in the same way. Not by what we see, but treat them as perfect, as if they've never done anything wrong. Can you do it? It's not easy. It's not easy to do. Michael Jordan, I was in Chicago when Michael Jordan was the best. But he got old, and he went and played for another team. And at 40, whatever years old, he was in the All-Star game one last time. And he went up to dunk the ball, and he couldn't do it. It hit the rim. They don't show that when they have a little highlight reel of Michael Jordan. There's dunk after dunk after dunk. But they don't show when he missed it. That gets edited out. That's what God does with us. He knows that we make mistakes, but he edits all that out, and he treats us as if we're perfect. And he expects you and me to do that with each other. I've been trying this out in a few wedding sermons. I stand in front of a couple, and I try it out with them beforehand, and I said, you guys, would it be possible for you to do the next 50 years without ever criticizing each other, without ever calling the other one out, without ever putting them down, with their voice never rising, never having a big argument. Could it be possible that you could just give that act, gift of love and treat them as if they are perfect, even when you know they're not, for the next 50 years? Never a harsh word. Why don't we do it? Because we're afraid. Is that if we don't call them out, they'll keep doing it. They'll put their clothes on the floor. But what if, if we loved them so much that they would stop doing that? 
Someone comes late, they don't call. We don't call them out. Just carry on. What would that be like to be in a marriage where you were never called out a single time for 50 years? Love mercy. What about church? <laughs> what would it be like to go to at least one place in your life where people never treat you by what they see or what they know about you or where you came from or anything else? They treat you as if you were perfect all the time. Never call each other out. Never speak down to anybody. The rest of our world, you're in a football team. You mess up, the coach will call you out. Tom Brady, what, six Super Bowl championships? He changes to another team the first game. He makes a few mistakes. The coach calls him out publicly on television, went over the whole country. The coach got called out for doing that. Ah, you shouldn't do that publicly. Choir, you mess up. Somebody's going to stop. It's like someone singing the wrong note. Just do it over. You get called out. At work, you mess up. They write you up. What if church was the one place that was just safe? Everybody loves mercy to treat you as if you were perfect, even though no, you're not. Don't tell stories about what people used to do. It's gone. It's forgotten. Just love mercy. You love God and you love his people. Wouldn't that be something? Could we do it? Tony Campolo tells a story. Some of you probably have heard it. It's a great story. Tony Campolo went down to a church in the south, Carolina somewhere, and in a place where there was all these ethnically separated churches, white church, black church, you know, all the different groups. Here was a church that was completely multicultural, 500 people. He said, what happened here? <laughs> He said, uh, our pa we were a small church, pastor died. And we couldn't find another pastor to come, so I raised my hand and said, I'll, I'll be the pastor. <laughs> okay. He says, I preached my sermon on loving each other no matter what, regardless of your color, country, or ever, anything else. People didn't much like that. So I <laughs> preached the same sermon again. <laughs> Deacons pulled me aside and said, that's it. Don't you preach that anymore. He said, I fired those deacons. He said, why didn't they fire you? He said, I didn't, they didn't hire me, so they couldn't fire me. I fired them. He said, I preached that sermon every week for a month. He said, I preached that church down to four people. But then I only let people in who had learned to love people that they were raised not to love. That they were touched by Jesus and they were different now. And we love mercy. And here's a church with 500 people. Nobody judges each other. Nobody categorizes the stereotypes. You're from this color or that language or that country or anything else. Just love. And God says, that's all I require of you, that you love mercy. Just to tell it one more time, Dr. Taylor, I'm sure you know this story. HMS Richards, I got to preach one time in my life with HMS sitting there. <laughs> old, old man. But what a giant, and he would go to black churches around the country, and he would shout it out, you know. You know black people aren't going to be able to go to heaven. Not going to be any black people in heaven. <laughs> and he'd get a little tension going, and he would shout it out again. There will be no black people in heaven. People starting to get mad. Then he would pull the plug, and he would say, there won't be any white people either. Won't be any brown people, won't be any yellow people. There'll be only red people washed in the blood of the Lamb, Jesus Christ. Someday we're going to figure that out. God said, that's what I require, love, mercy. Treat people as if they're perfect. I got involved in the women's ordination movement. That isn't the point here today. I had no desire, no plan to be a controversial person. I sat on a staff with six pastors, four men and two women. I watched a woman cry, doing the same work, gifted by God, called by God, but not affirmed by their church in the same way. Hurt, something they had no choice over. That's what we call discrimination. When you are treated differently for something that you had no choice. You're tall or you're short. You come from here, you come from here. You speak this language. You're male or female. 
Don't have any hair. Not our fault. We didn't choose that. Jesus says we love mercy. We treat people equally. Number three, before we're done, treat people based on their potential, not their actual. C.S. Lewis on The Weight of Glory talks about this great stuff. He says, you, God doesn't treat us the way he sees how we are. He treats us on who we're going to become when he is in our life and God, fullness of God is in our lives. Treat each other based on our potential, not on who we are. I've gone to the Philippines 30 times. And I've gone long enough now that I have people come up to me. They're pastors and teachers now, but he said, Pastor Dan, you baptized us. I baptized you? <laughs> Thousand people in a pool. These people are kids. You're baptizing one after the other. And now they come back 15 years later, little kid, and now they're a teacher or a pastor. You don't know. And God says, don't treat people based on what you see or who they are right now, what they will become. C.S. Lewis says, someday, there are no ordinary people. Someday we're going to see them in heaven, and they will be so amazing, you'll be tempted to bow down and worship them as a god or goddess because they're so amazing. You don't know who's going to be that way. I had a girl come up to me at a college in the Philippines and said, Pastor Dan, remember me? No, you baptized me, little girl. Now in college, and no regrets, no. Whoops, sir. We were preaching in the Philippines last year. After my sermon, it was raining hard on the tin roof. We couldn't leave. It was so hard. I went to a couple back on the back just talking to people like I do. How are you? 26 years old. Where are you from? Island of Palawan. I said, what church are you from? Told me the name. I said, you know Pastor Micah Mufawa, Zimbabwe pastor, friend of mine? He said, he baptized me. I said, dude, he's here. He's here with me right now. I said, what are you going to do? I'm going to be a theologist. I'm going to be a pastor. <laughs> we had a picture the next day. Picture the next day with him and that kid together. Ten years ago, he was a 10-year-old, 15-year-old kid. Now he's going to be a pastor. You never know. We treat each other not on their actual, but on who they're going to be someday. That's what it means to love mercy. mercy. And Jesus says, this is what I require of you. This one thing. You can't remember anything else. Do justly. Love mercy. Love mercy. Enjoy the song. We'll come back for final prayer.
This little boy had muscular dystrophy. He went to a fundraiser. They were raising money for, for something. And he wanted a basketball signed by all the ba basketball players. And a rich man went forward and paid a lot of money for it and gave it to that little boy. He will never shoot the ball and never do it. Give a basketball to someone. Give someone love and love mercy.